This is Henry Paulson. Henry Paulson is the former United States Secretary of the Treasury. We had, you know, the military competition around the world. And exactly the opposite has happened. What's happened is that the security competition is bled into the economic competition and they become in many ways one and the same. Uh, that, uh, and a big part of this has been technology, the rapid advance of technology. And here I'm talking about AI, advanced manufacturing, quantum computing, all these technologies of the future, the, you know, the digi digital highways, the, the, the internet, and, and so on. So th this is really where the economic battle is taking place. Each country is racing to, uh, to develop the t new technologies and set the standards of the technologies of, of the future, which is going to underpin the global economy. RippleNet's Global Payment Steering Group. Interledger, part of the W3 Web Standards. Ripple joins the ISO standards for cross-border payment. So there's a massive competition on technology. And, and then there, there are pressures in both countries, but particularly in the U.S., to sequester technology in order to protect our national security. And although that needs to be done, and is vitally important and, and, and long overdue in certain areas, there's a real danger that we can go so far and go so far that in attempting to hurt China and isolate China, we cut ourselves off from uh, the, the, uh, the rest of the world and the global uh, uh, innovation ecosystem and so on. Blockchain distributed ledger technology, it offers trust. It's a level playing field. And, and so this is a very complicated, a very important area. And I, you know, I made a speech a couple of years ago where I talked about the danger of another economic iron curtain. Uh, and I, I think we are going to see, uh, and, and there should be an iron curtain. The question is whether it, it is a, a, which I think it should be a small yard and a high fence, okay, as opposed to a big yard with a moat around it. But a walled garden does not necessarily have to be money. That's, but, but that's being played out now. Uh, another major stru structural change is uh, the attitude of U.S. business. That, uh, that uh, the business community has been fragmented. And the fact that China has been so slow in opening up their economy to competition, you know, almost 20 years after WTO, has discouraged some companies to the extent to which they have uh, turned from, from being uh, wanting to, to, uh, to keep working in China positively to, uh, to really lobbying, you know, uh, Congress for more anti-China measures. And China misread this because many U.S. companies, when they were in meeting with Chinese leaders, they were saying, oh, this is wonderful, you're great, etc." And then they'd run back to Congress and say, I can't tell, tell you how bad this situation is. And, uh, and, and part of it are structural changes in China because the, as they become a $13 trillion economy, they are implementing their own regulatory structure. Amex and Linlin Pay are coincidentally RippleNet customers and China grants payment license to them. You know, their own anti-monopoly laws and national security laws which domestic Chinese companies find very, very difficult and hard to adapt to. So there's a lot going on. But to, to get back to, to ending in, in terms of a, a new framework, as I said, both countries are, are very different and they've got evolving interests. And I, I think the Chinese side has got to recognize that what was acceptable to the U.S. when they were you know, a $200 million economy, maybe even a trillion dollar economy, is no longer acceptable when there are $13 trillion powerhouse exerting influence all around the world. And the U.S. has got to recognize that China is too big to just simply dictate to. 
the world is not going to be governable unless we find some common ground. The G20 has been given guidance by the FSB for crypto assets. The G20 is currently working on the framework. And so I think it's very, very hard to find a, a, a common ground given the evolving interests of both countries. But the, the thing that gives me most hope here is that each country needs a stable environment. We each need peace. We each need rules. We need we need global stability, and uh, and so we we have a strong interest in global order. But this is going to this is you know this is going to take time to hammer out. Well, thank you for that very thorough uh, answer. Um, you know, I, I in listening to uh, your Cold War Iron Curtain metaphors, high fence or moats, um, I, I wonder. Uh, which side Europe is going to uh, fall in uh, in that kind well, of world? Well, well I, I would say this. Europe, in my judgment, it, uh, Mark, it's what, what we saw when, when, when I was at Treasury to, to a large extent, uh, what we saw in Europe and, and all around the world. When we were working with our allies and we said, <clears throat> you know, the Chinese have got to move their currency. They've got to open up. Let's put pressure on them. They'd say, way to go, you the man, go do it. You know, we'll be right behind you. And then they were leading trade missions you know, to, to China. So, uh, and here, I, I, I do believe, you know, a, a, a more serious uh, and maybe thoughtful answer to that uh, question is, I think a lot of this is gonna be determined by China's foreign policy and their actions coming out of the pandemic. And the dollar is being a proxy for the US economic performance and success. And- uh, The dollar represents the US success, but COVID has slowed the economy. So, so, so number one, I start there. Number two, I think the dollar will be the primary reserve currency Based uh, continue to be based upon uh, the things that we do in the United States of America, as opposed to what what happens in China or, or in other places. The um, and I, I think the key to that is going to be our governments our government's ability to adapt our economic policies as we come out of the pandemic so that more Americans participate in our economic success. Because our economy has got to work for more Americans, for our government to work. And, and so I think that's going to be very important. And, and of course, it's going to be essential that we maintain our fiscal strength. There's not a single example in the history of any nation that's continued to be a great country if they dissipated their, their, their fiscal discipline and fiscal strength. So that means managing the national debt, but what it really means is uh, dealing with this st structural deficit over a period of time. And we have this big structural deficit that's created by the aging of our society, the entitlements, and a shortage of revenue. So debt is the issue. He said, quote, the aging of our society, the entitlements and the shortage of revenue, meaning your taxes are too low. So th that's going to be very important. And then as you get to in internationally, which I was just going to, to, to move there, I, I really do think our ability to influence and lead internationally is going to be determined by our are we a success here? Are we an eco economy that people want to emulate? Are we a strong economy? And our ability to lead uh, globally. And th that's going to be, we are going to have to play a role in leading to come up with rules for trade. You know, the WTO is, is basically dysfunctional now. We need a, 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 a system for, for rules for trade, for technology standards, for, for, for investment, all of that's going to be important. 
There are multiple trade platforms that can be trusted because they utilize distributed ledger technology. And now you asked a question about uh, sanctions. Now, you and I knew, we, we, we did quite a bit with sanctions when, uh, when I was at Treasury. And we knew that by far the most effective sanctions were multilateral. Unilateral sanctions are just more difficult. When you have multilateral sanctions, they're more effective. But the fact that we are not just the primary reserve currency, but we are the only you know, uh, leading reserve currency gives us the ability to have unilateral sanctions and, and to weaponize the dollar. And you know, because you and I have talked about this a lot in the past, that I believe that there's this is not cost free. Because when you weaponize the dollar and you impose unilateral sanctions, this ma makes it much more likely that not only will your adversaries want to have another major reserve currency, but your allies. I think everybody's on the same page, including Trump. Well, and and it also increases the likelihood that your allies and adversaries will work together to develop another reserve currency. This is Project Stella. Project Stella uses Interledger. And so we've seen the Europeans right now. This is one of the big things driving the Europeans is they're working to develop another primary reserve currency. Project Stella tested Interledger with Bank of Japan and the ECB. So yes, there is a cost to weaponizing the dollar and using it to impose unilateral sanctions. But, you know, it, it, there's also the fact that we are the primary reserve currency. We have the ability to do this occasionally. Uh, but I don't think it should be the preferred option. And I don't think it should be something that I think many people are rather naive uh, when, when they look at this as a tool. You know, you know what some of the, the costs of some of the other tools are, but this this is a hidden cost.